very much, Christian, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and also from my side, a very warm welcome to the, this educational workshop on uh, fecal calprotectin. And it is my pleasure now to give you, uh, as the opening of the session, a, a brief overview about the insights into the biological function and the biochemical analysis of calprotectin, because it's a very interesting protein. And I will be first focusing on introducing you to the structure of calprotectin, and then we will, I will talk about the uh, biological function, and then we will see how um, calprotectin is a, has become a very valuable biomarker in many ways, and in the end we'll see uh, what uh, options are available to measure actually calprotectin concentrations, and what are the advantages and what are the challenges. And uh, you can see it's... Uh, Sorry, uh, still related, the measuring of calprotectin is then still related to the structure, and I will uh, go into that, how the structure is also relevant for how we measure calprotectin. So calprotectin exists biologically as a dimer and as a tetramer, which is dependent on the calcium concentration that it encounters. So here you see a crystal structure of calprotectin as a heterodimer, it is composed out of two subunits, and you will find in the literature uh, various different names for it, for example, MRP14, MRP8, or S100A9, S100A8. But uh, looking at this uh, heterodimeric structure, what is highlighted here is that you can see in green, these green spheres, those are actually uh, calcium binding sites, and that's a very important feature for calprotectin's function, because if, um, if uh, there is sufficient calprotectin uh, in the environment, uh, sorry, uh, if there is sufficient calcium uh, around calprotectin, it actually tetramerizes and forms this tetramer shape. And it does that at um, a cal a calcium concentration of around 200 micromolar. And this is important because in blood, we typically have around two millimolar. Uh, calcium present. So that's about tenfold higher than what is necessary for this tetramization to occur. And one of the main functions of calprotectin is uh, also uh, in a binding site uh, for other metal ions other than calcium. So for example, like zinc, manganese, or nickel. And it has one binding site per subunit, and as a dimer, it has a lesser affinity for these other, other metal ions. But as a, a tetramer, it has a much higher affinity uh, for metal ions like zinc, manganese, or nickel, and we will see how that uh, relates to the biological function. So if we look at the body, where do we actually find uh, calprotectin? So if we look at uh, granulocytes, they are a type of immune cell, uh, like a white, white blood cell, that is important for the first line of defense of the body's immune system. And these granulocytes, they carry granules inside, uh, like antimicrobial peptides, that are released uh, to prevent infection and to attack invading pathogens. And 40 to 60 percent of these uh, granulocytes are neutrophils. And uh, uh, the neutrophils are the most abundant type of phagocyte in the body. And they're typically found in the bloodstream. About 60 percent of the total circulating white blood cells are neutrophils. And inside these neutrophils, the most abundant cytosolic protein is calprotectin. So about 40 to 60 percent uh, of the protein content in neutrophils is calprotectin. So if we put this all together, the most abundant protein within the most abundant type of uh, white blood cell in the bloodstream really highlights the role of calprotectin that if a pathogen uh, enters the body, it is very likely to first encounter a neutrophil and therefore also calprotectin. And then in addition to that, calprotectin is also expressed in epithelial cells, uh, which line the organs and the blood vessels uh, uh, throughout our body. And it, calprotectin is also upregulated in various inflammatory diseases. So if you put that all together, uh, calprotectin plays a major part in the first line defense system. And how does it actually work? So what we understand for now is uh, that uh, you see up here in the schematic, uh, a neutrophil that when it encounters a pump, which is short for a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, and if it recognizes that, it starts to de degranulate, so it releases its content. 
There are also some other pathways through uh, reactive uh, oxygen species which can uh, cause the neutrophils to basically explosively expel um, their content, which is it's a uh, process called netosis, uh, neutrophil extracellular traps, uh, which can attack the invading pathogens. But uh, what we want to focus on is this pathway here where the neutrophils degranulate and release calprotectin. And it does that at very high concentrations locally, and in that environment, calprotectin is released as a dimer. And as a dimer, it can then bind to uh, other receptors on other neutrophils, specifically the toll-like receptor 4. And when it calprotectin as a dimer binds to this receptor, it can further trigger um, release and degranulation of further uh, uh, of neutrophils to further release calprotectin. So this whole pathway actually increases further and further the release of calprotectin, so it's a pro-inflammatory or an alarming pathway. But that happens mainly locally, because once calprotectin as a dimer is released to the blood and mixes with the blood, due to the calcium concentration in blood, it forms a tetramer. And then as a tetramer, it cannot bind anymore to this toll-like receptor 4, but instead it has been found only recently, about one, one and a half years ago, that um, it can bind to the other receptor, CD69, which has been shown to have an anti-inflammatory signaling. So uh, it's, the current understanding is that it slows down the migration of monocytes, but there this part still requires a little bit more of understanding. It's fairly new. So the second part of calprotectin is, has an, actually an anti-inflammatory and a calming uh, effect. And it's very interesting about this protein that just by switching the oligomeric state, it has this very antagonistic functions. And that is also very important to have this self-regulating function that it avoids to overshoot the uh, inflammatory response uh, so that the body um, does not go into shock or septis, sepsis, but it basically regulates itself through this uh, calming function. And then in addition, as another function, uh, as the tetramer, as I said earlier, from the structure, it can bind metal ions, and when uh, certain pathogens, like microbes, invade the body, they feed off metal ions of these nutrients. And uh, tetramer calprotectin uh, can sequester these metal ions, and therefore uh, calprotectin also has an initial, uh, nutritional immunity. It can starve these microbes. So it also has a further defense function. So through all this... Uh, um, processes, you can see how relevant calprotectin is for the immune system, and therefore it's easy uh, to imagine how it is also an uh, increasingly valuable biomarker. And here I focus first on uh, fecal calprotectin, which is calprotectin extracted from stool, and uh, it's already a very established biomarker from, for discriminating IBD, so inflammatory bowel disease, uh, from non-inflammatory diseases, and it is also used for monitoring the disease progression. And meta-analysis reported a 93% pool sensitivity and 92% specificity for detecting intestinal inflammation in adults. And the American College of Gastroenterology strongly recommends it to help distinguish between IBD and IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, which is not an inflammatory disease. And with all these features, it's no surprise that calprotectin testing volume has dramatically increased over the past decade. But in addition to uh, fecal calprotectin, uh, a more emergent function and application of calprotectin is serum calprotectin uh, or plasma calprotectin, which is calprotectin measured from blood or serum. And it has been shown that it is, uh, could be a useful biomarker for non-infectious inflammatory diseases like rheumatic diseases or the assessment of severe infections and sepsis, as well as a risk marker in severe COVID-19. And how now, uh, since we are in the session of fecal calprotectin, I want to focus more on how do we actually extract and measure uh, calprotectin from stool samples. And obviously, this starts with uh, first collecting the stool sample of the patient. And then one way of uh, extracting the calprotectin would be to take a small portion of the stool, weigh it, and then dilute it in a buffer. But nowadays, we have more convenient options. For example, this uh, extraction device here, um, which uh, is... Uh, composed of a grip with a, a, a pin, and at the end of the pin there is a dosing tip with grooves, and these 
grooves are basically stuck in the uh, patient stool sample a few times until they are filled, and then that, uh, that pin is then th thread through a funnel back into the reservoir of the device. And the function of the funnel is to strip excess uh, stool away, so in the end we end up with a very defined amount of stool that was taken just from these uh, grooves here. And then uh, the solution gets mixed so that uh, we get a homogeneous mixture of the stool sample in the uh, extraction and stabilization buffer, and at the end the uh, device can be opened and we can analyze the sample. And there is a variety of ways to analyze this and measure calprotectin for basically whatever requirements the laboratory or the user has. So, for example, we can analyze it using clinic, uh, clinical chemistry, which allows us to do automation or even full automation as uh, to integrate the testing into laboratory streets. Um, there is the availability, uh, available ELISA assay, which is often considered the gold standard to the high sensitivity. Um, but there are also lateral flow assays that can measure calprotectin that uh, come together with its own reader, which is uh, ideal for small labs or point of care. Um, applications and then lastly even we have um, and further lateral flow assays that the patient can do at home um, and then analyze or read out the result using their own smartphone and send the results to their treating uh, physician and that is a very great option for uh, monitoring uh, disease progression for calprotectin and uh, one very important aspect that I want to emphasize here is that the um, oligomeric state, so dimer or tetramer, uh, is not just relevant biologically, but is also relevant for the analysis and for the uh, quantitative results that we are getting from measuring calprotectin. So here you see uh, the dimer and the tetramer, and they are immunologically distinct, which means that some antibodies have higher affinities to a specific oligomer, oligomer, which is usually the tetramer, because it has a, a, a groove inside here that is not present uh, in, in the dimer. Uh, it will come back in one second again. Uh, for example, this uh, motif here is only present in the tetramer. And for serum calprotectin, it's uh, very likely to be uh, tetrameric due to the uh, calcium content in blood. But when we draw the blood from the patient and collect it, for example, in an EDTA tube, EDTA is known to capture and chelate uh, calcium. So we might capture the calcium and therefore transform the calprotectin from a tetramer to a dimer. So we are actually affecting uh, the result with our pre-analytics. And in stool, it is even a more complex matrix than uh, and changing matrix uh, compared to blood. And the conditions are therefore less defined. And with stool, we also require an extraction from stool. Um, and there, uh, certain aspects are relevant, like the extraction buffer composition. It is relevant for how much calprotectin do we actually extract from stool. It doesn't just happen like that, that you dilute it in a buffer and you get all the calprotectin. It needs to be extracted. And then as well, in which oligomeric state is that happening? And it, it, this extraction also for, uh, follows certain extraction kinetics. And when you measure then your sample, is calprotectin already fully extracted or are you actually still in the curve where it is only, where, where it has not yet reached its final value? And lastly, the stability of the extraction buffer is of course also important because uh, it um, requires the, the result to be stable ideally when measured over many days. And um, we've done internally a, a method comparison based on an external quality assessment uh, and a ring study where we took part. And you can see a, a method comparison between uh, 10 different tests that are on the market. market. This can be a LISA test, a chemiluminescence assay, uh, or a turbidimetric test, uh, compared to our turbidimetric Bühlmann f -Cal Turbo. And you can see that the quantitative results actually vary quite, quite distinctly. And this can, is about a factor of three between the lowest results and the highest results. So, and this comes down to what we believe, first of all, the oligomeric state that can differ across uh, different suppliers, that they recognize them differently, and as well the pre-analytics and how the stool is, uh, is treated. And we are, uh, at Bühlmann, are very interested in actually um, um, harmonizing that these results actually yield 
uh, the same quantitative results across multiple suppliers. And uh, what, what is necessary for that is a, a great analysis method and a good understanding for what <coughs> is happening uh, in these extraction processes. And we have uh, uh, found a very useful technique. Uh, it's called label-free differential scanning fluorimetry, and that can uh, very quickly and easily differentiate if you have a dimer or a tetramer state in the calprotectin. So it works in a way that it looks at the protein's structural integrity, so the foldedness of the protein. So the protein solution containing calprotectin is heated up, and then uh, the protein denatures, it unfolds, and during this unfolding process, the autofluorescence, so the fluorescence of the uh, amino acids is changing. And that yields a correct characteristic curve for calprotectin in its dimer and tetramer state. And I can show you here some data that we recorded of native calprotectin that when we do not uh, change the, the buffer of how we receive native calprotectin, it was somewhere here a line and black in the middle. But if we add increasing concentrations of EDTA, which basically captures the calcium and transfers it to a dimeric state, you can see the curve shifts up to uh, a characteristic uh, curve up here. And if we add calcium, depending on the calcium concentration, we can shift uh, the uh, oligomeric state towards the tetrameric state here. And it, the concentrations necessary for calcium agree very well which, what, with what has been reported in literature for being necessary for switching to the tetramer. So that is a very useful tool to optimize the buffer and uh, be sure that, you, that the conditions that you are having your buffer and your extraction and also your calibrators in uh, are the ones that you want. And in addition, we also developed a, a recombinant calprotectin and uh, we have a, a poster here um, at the World Lab and it's a fusion protein and what we've shown is that it can be purified in large quantities in defined oligomeric states and it shows immunological and biophysical properties identical to native calprotectin. And our idea would be that this could be a possible tool to harmonize uh, calprotectin uh, immunoassays. And if you're interested uh, to talk more about this, I'm happy to talk about this uh, after the session or um, you can just have a look at the poster here at the World Lab. And with that, I would like to finish uh, with the take home mes messages of today. Um, I hope you've learned or uh, realized that calprotectin plays a major role in the body's response to and defense from pathogens. Uh, it is an increasingly valuable biomarker, not just as fecal calprotectin, which is already well established, but also as serum calprotectin, which with more and more emergent applications. Um, and the oligomeric state is crucial for the biological function. So as a dimer, it's pro-inflammatory, as a tetramer, anti-inflammatory, and also has uh, nutritional immunity. But the oligomeric state is also uh, important for the diagnostic measurement. And there is expertise in the analysis and the pre-analytics is required to harmonize all these quantitative results uh, across different uh, suppliers. And uh, I'm very positive that in the future we'll still get a better biological understanding and, the more, di uh, and more diagnostic uh, applications are waiting for us uh, for calprotectin. And with that, I would like to finish with a picture of uh, our headquarter uh, near Basel in Switzerland. And on a, on a nice sunny day where you, when you feel particularly inspired and the right conditions are right, you see some tetrameric clouds in the sky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex, for your insights into this um, special biomarker.